I want to do um, a quick history tour of cataract surgery. Um, the reason is that cataract is a condition that is so common that we were all going to encounter it. As you all know, cataract is misting of the lens inside the eye. Everybody on the planet, if they live long enough, will get a cataract. Doesn't matter how pretty or how famous or how young you are, eventually you'll get a cataract. And so will your cat and your dog uh, if they live long enough. And that's because from birth, sunlight gradually causes um, alteration of the collagen fibers in the lens, which absorbs, absorbs UV light and the lens becomes cloudy. It is one of the commonest procedures performed in medicine. In the UK alone, 300,000 uh, cataract operations are performed per year. And although it is one of the commonest procedures performed and it's an extremely treatable condition, it is still the commonest cause of blindness throughout the world. And that's simply because there aren't enough surgical facilities to treat people in developing countries. <coughs> The first written record we have of cataract surgery is from 800 BC and it's in a, in a famous uh, ancient text uh, in India where uh, Maharshi Sushuntra uh, described coaching, uh, couching. This is a, a, a condition in which he had figured out that if you push the lens and dislocate the lens out of the pupil into the vitreous cavity, then uh, the vision returned. It was called couching because in the old days somebody would be tied onto a couch uh, and their head bound onto the couch so they didn't move and the ophthalmologist would arrive, stick a sharp instrument into the eye uh, and dislocate the lens into the vitreous cavity and immediately the vision would return. Now this was done 800 years BC. So you would think, why, why am I talking to you about couching? That's because although it was done 800 years BC, this is Nepal in 1998. This is couching in 1998. There are places in the world where couching is still practiced. In, in fairness, without tying the patient onto a couch, because there is now um, local anesthetic drops. But you can see here quite a skilled surgeon actually who has a, a spatula-like instrument and he has slowly pushed the lens and dislocated the, the zonular fibers and, and dropped the lens into the vitreous cavity using a torch. There's no microscope, there are no surgical lights. And What's amazing is that immediately afterwards, you can see that he's testing the patient's vision. This patient was totally blind and now can count fingers. This is India, 2001. This is, these are, are street performers. These are ophthalmologists that go from village to village and perform couching on the street. The patient is lying down on a pavement and look at what lubrication is used to keep the eye moist during surgery. The ophthalmologist just spits into their eye. Now, again, he finishes his procedure, uses a nice sterile cloth to clean the surgical field, and puts his instrument in his, in his, in his pen top and is off to the next village. He gets paid, and I bet he never returns to that village again. But look, he, the patient can see. So there is, he goes like this, wow, magic, cured. Now, back in 29 BC, Cornelius Celsus figured out that couching usually blinds people. And it blinds people because if you dislocate the lens into the vitreous cavity and you rupture the capsule of the lens, then the lens fibers become swollen, they set up an immune reaction and you get blinded. The poor Indian chap on the pavement in, in, in India uh, with the spit in his eye, I'm sure will get some horrific infection. I mean, he may get away with it, but most of the time, couching led to blindness. So people were starting to figure out a way 
of not causing all this inflammation. The first description of lens removal was by uh, Zachariah Al-Razi, who figured out a way of actually sucking the lens out of the eye. So he, uh, he will uh, use a needle to enter the eye and then just suck the lens out with his mouth because the lens is quite, it's quite soft material. Okay, he attributes his method to, to a, an earlier Greek second century physician called Antilus who had described it, uh, who had described the idea but didn't actually uh, perform the technique and didn't have the instruments to perform the technique. So people started thinking about removing lenses rather than just dropping them in the eye. Funnily enough, it wasn't until the 17th century that somebody figured out a way of removing the lens surgically. Now, he was the, uh, 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 this was the, the first time the eye was actually cut open and the lens removed in total without just sucking it out but actually removing it. The biggest problem was that there, were, there wasn't enough suturing, fine enough suturing material to close the wound. So patients would had, have their eye cut open, the lens squeezed out, and then they would stay on bed rest for two weeks with sandbags around their heads to immobilize the head. So they didn't move at all, they didn't squeeze, their eyes would be bandaged until the cornea healed over. Von Grafe perfected this technique by developing the Von Grafe knife and this became standard treatment for cataract surgery for many, many years. Okay. Now, by this time, suture material became available and the cryoprobe became available. So instead of pushing the lens out of the eye, uh, they would use carbon, uh, uh, carbon dioxide to freeze a probe onto the eye so that you can dislocate the eye. And this was considered a fantastic development because when you squeeze the lens out of the eye, you can suddenly come out and you can rupture the vitreous and you can cause a lot more damage. If you can gently pull it out of the eye, it revolutionized. This revolutionized cataract surgery, as well as the advent of 10 nylon sutures. The problem with intracapsular cataract extraction is that when you remove the lens and you remove the capsule, the capsule is attached to the vitreous. So this is the back of the capsule, these are the zonular fibers. The vitreous gel is attached to the capsule and the vitreous is attached to the retina. So if you pull this out and you pull the vitreous forward, then you can cause a retinal detachment by transmitting traction onto the retina. So people started thinking of leaving the capsule behind and removing the lens material. And this is called extracapsular cataract surgery. In extracapsular cataract surgery, you cut the capsule open, you take out the lens, and you leave the capsule intact so that you don't disrupt the vitreous. And of course, it leaves you with an empty bag and it opens the, the way for intraocular implantation. When people started to experiment with this technique, World War II broke out. And as in most wars, we develop some of our greatest, uh, we have some of our greatest innovations when we are at our worst as a species. We're very good at being very clever when we're thinking about how to kill each other and then how to make each other better after we've shot each other to hell. So the Battle of Britain is, is very famous in history as being a period of time when Germany was constantly bombarding Britain in order to prepare for an invasion of Britain. So for many days, Spitfire pilots were flying over the English Channel, uh, defending uh, England, and a lot of them were shot down. When they were shot down, then a lot of the perspex material that the Spitfire has on top of it would be shattered and fragments would be lodged into the pilot's eyes. And that's exactly what happened. This chap is called Harold Ridley, and he was an ophthalmologist, 
um, in the south, in the south coast of England, where a lot of the Spitfire um, runways were. And this was a, a flight ace. This was one of the one of the most successful Spitfire pilots. He got shot down. One eye was completely ruined, and the other eye had a piece of uh, perspex material, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, lodged into his eyeball. So Harold Ridley was examining this pilot on a daily basis, trying to save his eye, and he noticed that there was no inflammation set up. He sutured the eye closed, there was no infection, and this piece of PMMA was lodged in his eye with no ill effect whatsoever. So he came up with a genius idea of getting PMMA and lathing it and fashioning an intraocular implant. And thus came along in, 19, um, uh, in 1950, in St. Thomas's Hospital, the implantation of the first intraocular implant. This is a, a video of one of his uh, early teaching surgeries. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing that uh, the Royal College of Ophthalmology has an amazing collection of videos, historical videos, um, of, of early teaching videos. And, and this is presumably done with a camera. Uh, there was no video in 1950. But you can see this is the Von Grafe knife. So the eye, about um, 180 degrees, is sliced open and the lens is uh, the capsule is open and the lens will be squeezed out. Okay. These uh, sutures are not to close the eye, but these sutures are actually to keep the eye steady once the lens comes out because the eye becomes very soft. Um, so the capsule was removed and then you can see the lens just being pushed out. This is a saline solution, just washing out any lens fragments left behind and then you'll see the intraocular implant. So the intraocular implant was, uh, as you can see, it slipped out of the forceps. It was uh, made of PMMA, it was hardened plastic, uh, and it had, it was just a, a round ball. And that was its biggest failure. Because it was loose inside the eye, it would rattle around inside the eye and hit the cornea and damage the cornea. So in the, 19, in the 1950s, at a Royal College of Ophthalmology meeting, a group of patients chained themselves to the gates of the conference hall with placards saying, Harold Ridley blinded me. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was, there was a lot of animosity and there was a lot of uh, um, objection to initial stages of intraocular implantation. However, the, uh, Harold Ridley persisted and he formed in 1966 the Intraocular Implant Club. And, and just, just to give you an idea how recent intraocular implantation is, this guy here uh, is a guy called Michael Roper Hall, who's actually one of the consultants I worked for. And I'm not that old, okay? I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. So people who invented intraocular implantation were around until quite recently. In fact, he's 103 and he's still alive and he comes to the meetings as an honorary member. Okay. So this is extra capsular cataract extraction uh, perfected. Okay. So Harold Ridley's initial, uh, initial treatment was really quite, quite rough, but as this is 1990s. Okay. Um, Again, the capsule is open, the lens is squeezed out. The big change is that lenses now have haptics. They have little springy legs. So when you put it in, they spring open and hold up against the capsule and they don't move around inside the eye. The other thing is that discovery that, that when, you tr when you operate on the eye, you must not damage the endothelium of the cornea because uh, that's what makes the cornea go opaque. So there is the haptics, you, you push them in and you put the haptics inside the capsule and that makes the lens very, very stable. And there is very fine suturing material to seal the wound. So for many years, so from 1970s to the 1990s, this was the main uh, treatment for cataract surgery with 
incredible success. Okay. What was the problem with it? It's quite a big wound. <coughs> it's usually elderly patients, diabetic patients, okay? patients with, with uh, uh, immune deficiency. So the wound with a rough, with a, even minor trauma would rupture. Also sutures <coughs> would cause suture tract infections and suturing the eyeball changed its shape. So it wasn't a perfect sphere. So focusing was weak. So the idea was that we should do cataract surgery through a smaller opening. Along came this chap, Charles Kelman, who is sitting in his dentist chair, having all the plaque removed from his teeth with an ultrasound probe. So he asks his dentist how this thing works. What is this thing that's buzzing and taking uh, plaque off? And he explains to him, so he goes off to the manufacturers of the ultrasound probe for his teeth and he manufactures a phaco probe. So a phaco probe is a needle that vibrates at 40 hertz, it's 40,000 times a second. It vibrates in and out and 40 hertz liquefies collagen. Okay, so he experimented with the frequency of the ultrasound. It liquefies collagen, lens collagen. Okay. He attached that to uh, uh, an irrigating tube and an aspirating tube. So, he, so his phaco probe, you would stick it in the eye, it would liquefy, suck out the bits that it liquefied and inject fluid inside the eye. His initial idea was in 1967. It wasn't really introduced until the 1990s, again because of technological problems. And, and um, the other thing is there was a lot of resistance because it was difficult, it was expensive. To do an extra capsule, you needed a knife and a, and, a, and a needle holder. Okay, To do this thing, you needed a machine and tubes and all that kinds of thing. And there was another thing. That what's the point of making a two millimeter opening if the lens is seven millimeters wide. Uh, so I do the surgery, I do the surgery with expensive equipment, and then I cut the eye open and put in the lens and stitch it. Why don't I just cut the eye open and take the lens out in the first place? Okay. But across the world, another innovator was working on something completely different, and, and that was foldable lenses. So even though Kahi Zhu had no way of taking the cataract out through a small hole, he figured out a way of putting a lens through a small hole. So these people were in opposite ends of the planet, okay, working on the same thing, but starting at different ends. And eventually, the two ideas came together. Okay. And we developed phaco emulsification. So in phaco emulsification, you make a stab incision on the eye, uh, two millimeters wide, it's stepped so that there is a, 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 a trapdoor, so you don't need to suture it because when you come out, the fluid pushes the trapdoor shut. You open the capsule of the lens. Again, uh, you inject fluid to free the lens material and you inject, you use the phaco probe to liquefy and aspirate the lens out of the eye. Of course, the phaco probe is, is much finer. It's connected to a computerized machine that measures how much fluid enters the eye and it makes sure that it injects exactly the same amount of fluid as is aspirated out of the eye, thus maintaining a constant volume. Because if you, if you aspirate faster than you inject, you empty the eye. If you inject more than you aspirate, then you overinflate the eye and put the pressure up and damage the optic nerve. So once the capsular uh, fibers are polished and cleaned, then comes the foldable intraocular implant that can be injected, unfolded, and this is made of, of acrylic, not PMMA. Once it reaches body temperature, it becomes very, very stable. And again, uh, when there is fibrosis of the capsule, it sticks to the lens and it becomes um, uh, uh, you know, uh, centered. Now, this technique has been around uh, since 1990 right? and it was almost perfect. Okay? Very little distortion of ocular surface 
very difficult to rupture a two millimeter wound even if you get a punch. I mean, if, a, if trauma is big enough, strong enough to rupture a two millimeter wound, it will rupture your, eye, your eyeball anyway. Okay, so why do we need anything else? Right. And yet, as always, the better we get at providing treatment to patients, the more we want to do. In the days when people were dying from pricking their eye, their, their finger on, on, on a tree from uh, infection, penicillin came out and everyone thought, that's it, that's the end of it. Why do we need other antibiotics? It's not like that. The better you get at what you do, the more your patients, the more you will demand out of what you're providing. So the, 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 the need was to have perfection, not just to make patients see, but to actually make them see perfectly, optically perfectly, without glasses, neither for distance or near. And to do that, you needed more technology. Along came along Excimer laser. Now, Excimer laser is a photodisruptive laser that is used in the computer world to design and manufacture computer microchips. So the way you make a microchip is that you have a copper plate coated with, a, with an insulating material and then a laser goes along and draws on this microchip, uh, sorry, uh, draws on this microchip um, the circuit of the computer. This is a, a human hair uh, and, and IBM here is showing off their Exciter laser. Okay, so a couple of students who were doing their PhD on Exima laser um, got drunk on a Thanksgiving day, all right? And they went back to the lab, took some leftover turkey with them, eating and drinking in the lab, and they came up with the idea of writing their name on the turkey cartilage and leaving it as a prank for their professor. Their professor looked at this and noticed that this is a thermal burn from a 532 five, nanometer laser and this is a cut with the Excimer laser. And to their astonishment, there was no collateral lens damage. So an Excimer laser could remove a single cell and not damage the cell next to it. And this was a, a eureka moment. Okay. You can use the Excimer to you remove single layers of cells from human tissue. And it was applied by Tolkien to the eye in 1987, got FDA approval in 1996. And the Excimer laser today is, a main is the treatment for, for cataract surgery. And basically the huge advantage is precision. So the patient, instead of using a knife, you use a sucker to connect the eyeball to the laser. The surgeon um, watches the eye through, through a camera and actually designs with, with a cursor the shape, the size, and the position of all the incisions in the eye. And then you press the button and the laser does all the cutting. So you know exactly what size what position, at what angle the implant will be. And that gives you precision. So here is, a, uh, here's the, uh, this is, this is uh, animation obviously, but this is, uh, you can see the eyeball coming up and then once it links to the laser, you get a green light and then you can draw on the computer screen exactly uh, how to operate. And it's ultrasound guided. So you can see how, how deep you want the cut, where you want the cut, and at what angle you want the cut. And this is um, Lensex, this is laser assisted cataract extraction, and this is today's uh, space age cataract surgery, going from the days of sticking needles in people's eyes uh, and sucking the lens out with your mouth. So, where do we go to next? It was very funny the other day, I was in the operating theatre with a couple of students and, and they were watching Lensex and they came up to me afterwards and they were very sad because they said, you know what, everything's been invented. Everything, there's nothing for it. We've become students too late. 
There's nothing for us to invent. You know, people have invented everything that I can think of. Right? So it's too late for us and it's a miserable life we're going to have and a miserable career. And it really made me smile because I remember thinking exactly the same thing when I was a youngster. Right? But of course, it's never like that. Okay? The beauty of medicine is that you never run out of ideas. The beauty of medicine is that there's no limit to what we can do. Every time we reach a, a, a point of excellence, we find the next problem to solve. And that's why I love medicine, that's why I love my career, and that's why you should enjoy yours. Okay? And you should let your imagination run free. Now, along the way, I'll give you a warning. Whenever you have a good idea, right, there will be people opposing it. Um, there are ideas for the treatment of cataracts just using drops. Okay? There are people regenerating lenses in babies that have been born with congenital cataracts, removing the congenital cataract and stimulating the regeneration of the lens. Okay? Innovators will never stop coming up with ideas and most of those ideas will be rubbish and most of those ideas will lead to nothing. But every now and again, one of those ideas will be fantastic. And when the cryoprobe was invented, okay, people with little imagination has, were saying things like this. The cryoprobe is here. There's nothing else to invent. There's no point in researching this anymore. We've reached the top. This was when people cutting their eyeball in half and freezing it right, and pulling the lens out. There were people thinking, that's it, we've reached the limit. Okay. When Kelman was, a, Kelman was ridiculed at most ophthalmology meetings at the idea of using his dentist's instruments to do cataract. And at a, at a, at a meeting, he said, I, I, when FACO became mainstay, they invited him to give an honorary lecture. And he said, I'd like to thank the people who opposed me because that's, that's what made me drive through. Okay? And when I was learning FACO emulsification, when I started ophthalmology in 1990, I was taught to do extra cap. FACO had not yet come to the UK. It was an American thing. It was an American hype thing, okay? Nobody believed in it. When it came to the UK, sort of 91, 92, people were saying, if you're over 30 years old, you're too old to learn FACO. So you're always going to find people like this in your career and you're always going to find people that try to put you down and slow you down, right? Use your imagination, okay? And, and do your best throughout your career. Anybody interested in ophthalmology is always welcome to Pantheo. Uh, and Pantheo um, Congress is coming up in April. You're all welcome to come there. Thank you for your time.